you've got the Carmelites, you've got the Jesuits. These are orders. And from these orders emanate or shoot out the congregations. For example, in the Oblates of the Virgin Mary as a congregation, we have, we have in our spirituality, we've got the Jesuit spirituality. We get the exercises. We've got the Redemptorist spirituality. That's why in the retreat yesterday, I spoke with so much passion about St. Alphonsus. He's basically, he's one of our, one of our fathers, one of our, our patron saints. We also have, um, we also have the spirituality of St. Bonaventure. He's known as the mystical doctor. We have as our basic theologian is Thomas Aquinas. You've heard of him. I think you have. <laughs> and we have, of course, St. Joseph as our universal patron with Mary, who is the foundress of the Oblates. So uh, it's good to be able to know the difference between diocesan life and religious life. Then in religious life, you have... Uh, you have different what's called charismatic graces. It doesn't mean the charismatic movement. What is charisma? Charisma means a specific physiognomy that God has betrothed upon a certain individual that he's going to leave as an inheritance to the church until that congregation uh, becomes defunct. And the principal reason why many congregations become defunct, according to Father Hardin, uh, is when we're not, we, we, we do not, we're not faithful to our charism, then the congregations, they, they disappear. Okay? And there are many that disappear. And that's very important. Therefore, if Okay, five minutes ago, I was, re I, I was carrying out my charism in a very authentic way. I was praying the rosary with 300 people. And they're trying to pray fervently with them, okay? They're trying to encourage them to pray the fervor, no? That's my charism. If I do that, I'm going to become a holy oblate. Because my charism is, as I had in the retreat with you people, right, is to get married known and loved. Do you know and love her more, better, no? Okay. We had the most Marian Ignatian retreat I've ever given, and my purpose was, you gotta fall in love with Mary. As I quoted St. Alphonsus yesterday, the reason why you've got tepidity, lukewarmness, and mediocrity is be a lack of devotion to Mary. St. Alphonsus. St. Alphonsus. Your devotion to Mary declines, you're going to become, you're going to become uh, mediocre, tepid, lukewarm. It's going to happen. Mary gives fire. Mary gives devotion. Mary gives us love for Christ. Mary gives us love for the church. Mary gives us a love for the salvation of souls. That, that's, that's Mary doing the fruits of the tree. Okay, now, um, let, let, me, let me go through then one of the basic um, tenets or evolution of an individual who arrives at what is called vows and then perpetual vows. Before entering into the religious life as well as the priesthood, um, today more than ever, there are, very, there are very serious studies of the, uh, of the person that's going to enter. I would conjecture to say that the formation of a really good priest, a holy priest, is probably the most difficult thing, probably the most difficult thing in the world. If you were to go through a typical day of what we do, you'd probably be shocked. 
Yeah, but uh, an hour, and, uh, two hours ago, I was at the bedside of someone that's dying. I mean, it's, <laughs> gotta say, mass, no, weddings. Um, we really, it's a, it's an emotional roller coaster. And um, if you're not able to ride that roller coaster, you're probably not called to be a priest. No? As we say in New York, you gotta roll with the punches. No, you know, you, you know, we just finished. We just finished. Uh, uh, a wedding and then we go to a funeral. Uh, the whole gamut. So there has to be a very rigid today, very rigid screening process for a religious as well as a priest. And I made, allu I made an allusion to this last, last week, I think it did, is both in the screening process of the religious life as well as the priesthood. If that, if that individual, uh, that, that man or woman, if you're going to become a nun, has uh, same-sex attractions, he doesn't have the vocation. Okay, now not all people agree with me, but I'm very firm on that. Very firm on that. I'm intransigent. You got a young man, they said he's gay, you're not, you're not called to be a priest. Stop discriminating, Father. No, <laughs> that's the problem the past 25 years. It's not so much child molestation, but it's homosexual acts that, of course, the press blows it out of proportion, right? It seems every, you know, every, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is gay, no? It's not the case. But it, it seems to be that way, no? It seems to be that way. So if if a young man comes in and he, and he has a certain same-sex attraction, uh, then he's not, he's not called to be a priest, no? Because sooner or later he's going to be acting it out. Even if he appears to be effeminate, no, it's, it's wrong, no? You can, pick that up, you can pick that up a country mile, no? So you have to have masculine priests, no? As well as if you have women that have same-sex attractions, you know, certain tendency to lesbianism, you're not called to be a nun. Now, many people disagree with me, and if you talk with other priests, they're going to say that I'm out in right field. You know? But Pope Benedict XVI, I'm basically saying what he said, and John Paul II too. So, if you have an avant-garde liberal priest who says that I'm um, you know, obsolete fossil of the Middle Ages, okay? Um, yeah, let them let criticize me, you know? That's the big problem. You have a, a priest that's living a double life, that's what's pushing millions of Catholics out of the church. That pushing them out of the church. And often what happens is, you have one priest that makes that mistake, if you study literature, there's a lot of uh, jargon that we learn in, 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 as English majors. One is you're going to learn that the, the phrase is called a sweeping generalization. Know what that means? It means, okay, Americans, they're materialistic, they're greedy, they're money hungry. Okay, you got them, but you got other Americans that are basically very generous. Look at those Asian people with those shifty eyes, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't trust them. That's terrible. So, but people make, the, people make those sweeping generalizations. One priest made a mistake. All priests have that problem. So, uh, to, to be accepted into religious life or to be accepted into the priesthood, you have to go through a very, very meticulous screening process. You know what? When I when I was filling in applications in, in 
1978-1979, it was basically you fill in the form, you know, you fill it, you fill it in, in five minutes, you give it. Well, you seem to be a pretty good guy, you know. But uh, in the past 40 years, we've gone from more or less solid families to dysfunctional families. You know, you know 50 years ago, basically the family was intact. 50 years ago. All of my friends were Catholics and Jews. I don't remember any of them. Their parents were divorced. This is 50 years ago. Jews and Catholics alike. So with that, you, you're not having these dysfunctional families where kids are growing up with gaping wounds, no? Gaping wounds. No? Okay. Uh, so maybe I'm kind of long-winded, but I think you should understand that the tr screening process has to be demanding. Uh, we, we, don't have, we don't have too many seminarians as oblates. But personally, the guys that we have, man, top-notch. This guy that was with us in the retreat, oh man, what a, what a gem, huh? What a gem, no? Brother Leland last year, I mean, what a... Brother Nathan will probably be ordained a deacon within a year and a half. These guys are kind of blowing me away. Their human formation, their intellectual formation, their prayerfulness, their holiness, their apostolic zeal. It's a breath of fresh air to see these young men that are really. But, you know, we have to be very, very um, judicious in our discernment as to um, who's going to enter in. There's probably, by the, by the time a young man is ordained a priest, we're pumping in a quarter of a million bucks. Do you have that in your back pocket? It's a lot of money. No? I'm saying a quarter of a million bucks. Food, clothing, education, doctor's bills, you know, gas bills. You know. So, you know, with that, and with the congregation, the congregation is basically, basically we're poor, we don't have a lot of money. So, okay, once the, say for example, the young woman enters into religious life, or the man, then you have a um, kind of a, a, a long process of formation before you make it. When I was a postulant, 1978 to 79, there was about, there was two, uh, two, two years, partial one year, two years. And there was probably about 80 of them. I think there are probably only three of us that are priests. No? So, you know, I'm making it. Because <laughs> back, back then, the, back then the, the acceptance was was very, very lenient. I remember one of my companions, he only lasted about six months, no? <laughs> he, uh, he, was, he was the only person we had from, uh, from England. And he came in, I remember, <laughs> he lasted six months, maybe five. He, you know, he, he, he sat at the table, he was saying, why do we have to study all this philosophy? Why do we have to study all this the theology? Let's go on the street, street, street corners of, of Rome and convert these brood of, these brood of vipers, no? <laughs> he only lasted five minutes, probably four months, no? <laughs> you're, gonna see, you're not gonna see a brother Jonas do that, no? Even though his name is Jonas, no? 40, 40 days in the interval will be perished. Huh? Okay, uh, the first stage is called being a postulant. I think in the sisters it's called like aspirant. They've got different, different, different jargon. Okay. For us, the postulancy program was two years. And in those two years, uh, when I was there, we studied in Rome. 
Those first two years, we studied philosophy. Some congregations have like one year of postulancy and then two years in the novitiate. I think the Jesuits have that. Pretty sure they got that one year of postulancy. You know what postulancy means? Probation. And it means a time of, in Spanish, probar, means to try. It's a time in which they're being, they're being tested. And I remember that some of our formators would, would actually try to test us to see if we're going to obey, be, be on time, say our prayers, testing us, testing the waters to see if uh, these guys are, you know, they're made of, um, they're made of steel or they're made of cotton candy. You know, there's a big difference, huh? Then after the two years of postulancy, the, uh, there's a discernment process in which the formators have to decide whether or not this would be a, a worthy candidate to become an oblate or Divine Mercy Sister. In our congregation, 90% if not more of the oblates are priests. We got a couple of brothers, no? but ours is, is basically a priestly congregation. How about the Christian brothers? Are they priests or are they, or, or are they brothers? How can you tell? Christian brothers, okay? <laughs> you don't pick up humor, do you? You gotta give me some coffee or something. You gotta pick up my English wit. <laughs> yeah, most of them, most of them are brothers. How about those who work with Saint, uh, in the congregation of Saint John of God? Most of them are brothers. No? Whereas for us, it's it's mostly mostly priests. And then after, after there's the acceptance, they enter into the novitiate. So that after the novitiate, we should be living what the word novitiate means. How's your Spanish? No vicio. Amen? Yeah. No vices, no? It used to be um, a common understanding that novices, they're very, um, they scandalize easily. They, they're scandalized at everything and they break everything. Okay? <laughs> so that year is a year in which you're not studying philosophy. You're not studying theology. You're not doing apostolic work. But you're, it's, a, it's a year dedicated to prayer and meditation and the holy hour and the mass and the spiritual life. If you like, it's like a year of retreat. It's like a year of retreat. Year of retreat. But it's a specific year of retreat in which we learn, we learn, number one is what is religious life? Number two, what is the priesthood? Number three, who are the oblates of the Virgin Mary, or the Sisters of Divine Mercy? So that whole year, we're learning the art of prayer, we're studying the document from Vatican II on religious life, which is Perfecti Caritatis, which is the, one of the 16 documents of Vatican II. 
and then abundant reading and studying who our founder is and the constitutions you know what that is the constitutions of the order of the oblates of the virgin mary so we're learning the art of prayer we're learning what it means to be a religious we're learning what it means to live to live in live in community for example if if a young man is brilliant he's got a deep prayer life even has the gift of celibacy but he, he can't live in community bye bye see you later alligator <laughs> And there are, there are men and women that they, they just can't, they can't live community life. And often they think that that happens if you've never really had a family life. You know, never had a family life is going to be difficult, more difficult than to live the religious life because the religious life is a family life. If you live in a family, you have to learn how to sacrifice and Roll with the punches. Hey, I'm one of nine. <laughs> uh, nothing's going to surprise me, huh? Which is a blessing. You're living in a family of nine, and you're number two of the nine. You know what it means to live in a family, no? Uh, I'm almost kind of like my older brother said, a moderate pessimist. I expect the worst, and if it doesn't happen, I rejoice, okay? <laughs> So then after those, after those, those um, 12 months, and we as oblates, given that our charism is Ignatian, we, uh, we make the 30-day retreat. So I happened to make, I, ha I happened to make my 30-day retreat right before my novitiate. You know where I made it? In Valais Junction in Quebec. Actually, I made it in French. Wow. Yeah. And I uh, couldn't speak too much French, but I studied and I could understand um, about 75% of it. Because the retreat master was one of the best uh, gen uh, French Canadian Jesuits in the country then. And he would send a lot of the Canadians to us as oblates. Because uh, Canada was already in a state of crisis where there was a lot of liberalism. So I've got a lot of companions that study with me that are French Canadian. And 10 years ago, our rector major was French Canadian. He was a guy that entered in with me. Okay, then if after that year of novitiate, the person is approved, and this is St. Faustina, St. Faustina, to be a, approved to enter into the Sisters of Divine Mercy for us to become an oblate of the Virgin Mary, then we make our vows. We profess our vows. Now, what is a vow? A vow is a solemn promise that's made to God. Okay? That's the best, succinct definition. It's a solemn promise that's made to God. And if you really want to understand it real well, of course, Thomas, Thomas Aquinas really explains it well. And he says that our, act, our actions technically have more merit and value than an action that's not done to run Done, done under a vow. So there's more merit. More merit. However, if your actions are motivated by more love, that trumps me. <laughs> but technically, theologically, acting, acting with vows, there's more merits and more blessings. However, it's a two-edged sword. There's an abundant grace, but also there's a double responsibility. So it's a two-way street. 
You know, the graces that come for, to those who live out their vows, but those who do not live out their vows, it's a double, double responsibility. Now, how many vows are there? Usually three. Usually three. However, there are sometimes four vows. And I'll mention the vows. You always have the vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. That's universal. But there are orders that have a fourth vow. How about the missionaries of charity, Grace? They have, a, they have four vows. The, th the fourth is that serving the poorest of the poor as a vow. That's a vow. You hear that? So, if they, if they, they despise, they reject helping out the poorest, they're breaking their vows. Who is the one that, 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 that composed that, the Holy Spirit, but Mother Teresa? His Mother Teresa wanted to work with the poorest of the poor. Okay, I don't want to pop your balloon or anything, but <laughs> he, he, here in L.A., uh, poorest of the poor, yeah, a few, but very few. We've had a poor program here for many years, and we've, we've won awards for it. I notice almost all of the ladies that come in, they are, can I use a New York expression? Pleasantly plump. That's a New York expression. If you want a more technical word, they're somewhat portly. Do you want me to say it in Spanish? Medio gordito. And they're coming, they're poor, they get their, they get their food, but they're not, they, they don't, I look, I look, I look, they don't look like they're dying of hunger. And I see some of them in McDonald's or something. But if you go to India, Indonesia, yeah. you see them. China, someplace in Africa. You know, you've ever seen the Biafra commercials where their yeah. arms look like toothpicks and their stomachs are bloated, you know, with their eyes sunken in and you know, flies descending upon them. That's poor. So here you. When I, I kind of listen, our poor program I always kind of laugh inside. No? Mas o menos. No? Menos que mas. Huh? Now, morally, culturally, intellectually poor, they win the cake. Yeah. For that, yeah. Morally, spiritually, culturally, with respect to literacy, you know, they, they, can, they can probably get a, win, win, win the prize for that. No, but... So uh, how, about the, how about the fourth vow of St. John of God? I worked with him as a deacon, and I was working on the Trastevere, helping out in their hospital, and barely ever did I, did I feel so well treated. I'm not, I'm not a deacon, I'm not, I'm not, even, not even a priest yet. And they only have brothers. They said, wow, you guys are, you guys are really, you're kind of like Martha. Hi, Martha. Martha. I mean, you're, you're so hospitable. And the guy said, well, we better. It's our fourth vow. <laughs> <laughs> so they had a vow of hospitality. What about Ignatius? Ignatius purposely offered the fourth vow to be at the beck and call of the Pope at all times. That's why we have Catholics in India, Indonesia, Thailand, Japan, because Ignatius sent his missionaries to the Far East. Otherwise, the, the, Asians, the Asians would, we wouldn't have any Asian Catholics. 
came from basically the missionary zeal of Francis Xavier, that the Pope wanted to open the horizons of the missionary activity. Other vo vows sometimes in, in kind would be that of stability. You know what that is? The opposite of mobility, Father. Okay, that's right. <laughs> it means you're, you're, you stay in the same continent. Of course, a lot of the Carmelite contemplatives have that. In other words, they're up the street of the Alhambra. They're, they're going to be there until they die. We've got a nun that was with us. Um, that was her spiritual director in Erie, Pennsylvania. That she's going to be there until the Lord calls her. Okay, now uh, a, a word. A word on these three vows. When you go into a Carmelite con convent, um, the the strict contemplatives. When they go into their cell. It's very um, austere. Very plain. But on the wall, there's a cross. Not a crucifix, but a cross. Because they are called to mount and to be nailed to that cross. Teresa of Avila. They're called to be mount and to be nailed to that cross with three nails. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Those are the three nails. But to be honest with you people, I feel if, 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 if you really live out your religious life and the vows, it's the, the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. It really is, if you live it out. If you don't live out the vows, you're never going to be happy. You, you, don't, you don't live out the, I mean, you're, you're lying. You, you promised to live out the vows. Why aren't you living them out? Not to say that any of, of us live them perfectly. Far from it, no. But we have to be striving to live out these vows more intensely every day. That's why the document for religious life, Perfecti Caritatis, is what? We have, to, we have to be always, always striving for perfect charity. Always striving. You know, striving means? Es for Sandus in Spanish, right? Always striving. <coughs> striving. Battling for, for perfect charity. And these vows are conduits or means by which we can arrive at this perfect charity. This is how we explain it. Okay, if you're if you're married, you have to go to you have to have you have to go to God, but you have to go through your your spouse, no? Whether you like it or not, okay. And I see I I honestly I see that more challenging because maybe your your spouse is resistant, or as we go directly to God. Directly to God. No, no human intermediary. Now these three vows, uh, I don't see these vows as slavery, but they're, they're incredible conduits or means by which we can arrive at perfect charity. And I see the the opposite, the, the opposite of these vows, the opposite of these vows are the major obstacles to living out a life of holiness and living out a life of perfect charity. 
my theological and philosophical mind you know, kicks in full gear when I think about these. I'll explain. Okay, poverty. Poverty. What is one of the major obstacles to arriving at eternal life? I'll give you a hint. Those who made the exercise with me, do you remember? Do you remember the call of the rich young man? <laughs> Forgot about that? Was he good? Yes. But he wasn't good enough for Christ. He was good, but not good enough. He wasn't good enough. What was his major obstacle? What? Major obstacle was that of his possessions. His possessions possessed him. He was a slave of his possessions. Right? He was a slave. So we, ent we enter into religious life. We enter into religious life. What we're saying is we, we are renouncing, we're renouncing the right of material possessions. Now, you people are cringing, but uh, honestly, I love it. I love it. What? No, diocesan. No, no, that's a good point. Diocesan priests can possess, if they got money, they can, they can buy a summer resort. They can. It's not a sin. They can buy a luxurious car. They can have a bank account with a lot of money in it. And uh, they, they don't have a vow of poverty. They don't. However, I would say that they should try to live the spirit of poverty. Because the people, people look, right? And people observe, right? It's real, it, this is, a, this is a, a, a point which is very difficult in the American society, very difficult. Because we have so much here. So much here. So much. We have so much in this country. You know, it, the, the society tends toward materialism. And I think a, a, a lot depends upon a lot depends upon the parents and the family formation. Give an example. I, you know, I, I don't come from a poor family. I don't. I don't come from a poor family. Better than an affluent family. My mom and my dad, I could, I could not, I could never eat between meals. No, I, 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 if, if it were 7.30 at night and my stomach was growling, I'd have to go up and ask my mom and dad, could I have a piece of bread? No, not until tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And usually they say, yeah, okay. If I, if I worked hard on Saturday, my dad would give me an allowance, 25 cents. <laughs> Before being ordained a priest, I had at least 15 jobs. Do any men here? You worked. I worked more than you. You name it. Peter, how much snow have you shoveled? 
You've never even seen snow, okay? Oh, come on, man, right? Eight years old. Eight years old shoveling snow with blisters. My father said, oh, poor Brisito. <laughs> Ah, you're a boy, you know, bite the bullet, they'll heal in three days. No? Being a paper boy, you know what a paper boy is? Always being fearful of the dogs, you know, running after you. <laughs> Cutting grass in August in New York, yeah, sweating like a mule, like a Thanks be to God. No? Tell you an interesting story of my father. <laughs> uh, our, our, our paper boy was uh, one, of, one of my best friends. And back in 1964, for seven papers, it would be 48 cents. 48 cents for, for seven papers because you, you deliver it every day, even on Sundays. So Robert Albanese was his name. He rang the bell and said, Mr. Broom, collecting. So you'd have these cards that you would actually clip off or mark to make sure that the customers paid. No altar boys here, I mean, no, no, no. None of you ever uh, had a paper route here in California, no? Do you know what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why well, if you had one? Okay. You only had about five, cu five customers, right? We'd have like 60 customers. No? So he asked, it, well, it, was 50, it was 50 cents, so my, it was, it was 48 cents. So my dad gave him 50 cents. And he got up and was walking away. Hey, Robert, get back here. Get back here. What's wrong, Mr. Broom? You owe me two pennies. What? It's 48 cents. And they gave you 50 cents. Give me back my two cents. <laughs> so he gave him back his two cents. And my father on the weekends, Saturdays, about every other, we would get together with his Catholic friends. They'd play poker nickel-dime poker. And guess who played with my, fa with my father? The father of Robert Albanis. <laughs> and he said, Bruma, you are the biggest cheapskate in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Bruma, you are the cheapest cheapskate in the world. You know what my father did? Well, he, he, he was always trying to teach. That's why his he bequeathed to the world a great Catholic school. And his son is all, you visited Elvira, right? It's a good one, right? But what he was teaching this kid is, don't, pres don't presume that it's yours. My father would have given him the two cents and probably another dime. Because he presumed that, he only got 48 cents. So what I'm, te what I'm telling you is, for me, uh, living out poverty, even though I don't come from a poor family, it was instilled in me by my mom and my dad. Because they were brought up and raised and seeing you know, parents that they just they didn't, want, they didn't waste things. Right? My mom would always have these coupons, you could save a little bit of money. And so that's one of the reasons why I have that vow, is that we will not become slaves of materialism. Amen? Amen. Amen. We will not become slaves of materialism. Okay, the, the other vows. Poverty, chastity. Um, it's not simply the renunciation of the conjugal act. That's part of it. 
But if that's the only thing you see in it, uh, you have a very, very limited vision of what that thou means. And it's basically this. It's worth saying, no, no to human love so that we can have a divine supernatural love. That's really what it is. We're saying no to physical paternity so that we can say yes to spiritual paternity. We're saying no to having a family of three, four, or five, and my parents, nine kids, pretty big family, so that we can have a family that has no limits. Every time I baptize, I'm a spiritual father. Okay, today I spent, today I spent about, about four hours in the confessional, quite a bit, huh? For Friday, huh? Maybe I confessed a hundred people, more or less, huh? When I lifted my hand, I said, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm exercising my spiritual paternity because God's grace is being born in me. Being born. Every time I lift up, every time I lift up the host and the chalice, Jesus is being born. It's Christmas. Every time. The priest lifts up the host and the chalice, Christ is being born. And not symbolically, but in actual fact. Three hours ago, I was in uh, Kaiser Permanente in Downey. Ever been there? <laughs> like a little city. I purposely parked across uh, the highway there because I know if I park in one of these parking centers, I'm gonna, I, will, I will be back in the year 2025. I'll be walking around until I'm 75. No? I prefer to walk half a block than to get lost. No? But I, I, I was there because there's a man in the parish that's dying now. So I went there, I, I, I gave him the anointing of the sick, I heard his confession, so that when he dies, he can go to the spiritual family of heaven. He's a family. Heaven is a family, right? And one of the most beautiful concepts is, is this, this is Augustine. I meditate upon the Word of God. And the Word goes from the biblical text into my eyes into my mind, then sinks into my heart. So the Word of God is no longer on the page, the Word of God is in my heart. So I'm preaching and teaching, I open up my mouth, and as Jesus says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I open up my mouth, <coughs> and I start to speak. So what is in my heart is ascending into my mind. I open up my mouth and words come up. So the words vibrate and they form words. Those words form sentences. Sentences form paragraphs. Paragraphs form concepts. And 
Where do they go? The vibration of the word that was in my, my heart and my soul has come out of my heart, out of my lips. It goes into your ears, up to your mind, and it goes down into your heart. Beautiful, huh? St. Augustine, not Father Broman. So the riches that I had in my heart is now in your heart. For that reason, preaching and teaching is one of the greatest acts of charity that anyone can do. As you, 100 people, you're going to be leaving after an hour, learning many things that you never knew before. Or if you heard them before, you're assimilating them all the more deeply. And you can start to share with others. Therefore, one of the reasons why I preach it, because I love it, but also it's one of the greatest ways to practice charity. If I pull out my wallet, I give you 20 bucks, I'm 20, $20 more poor. I open up my mouth and I preach. I'm not becoming impoverished, but I'm becoming all the more rich. The more abundantly I share, the more rich I become on the spiritual, on the spiritual realm. Got it? For, for me, my friends, that's the vow of chastity. And it all comes from this. That Jesus, you know, that we, that, that we meditated in the, in the retreat. You know? It all comes from a deep, loving friendship with Jesus Christ. Like St. John the Evangelist. You know? From a deep, loving relationship with Christ, and we can give Christ to others. So, a, a priest or religious is gonna he's gonna fail in his vows if he fails in his love for Christ. Fails in love for Christ, he can probably, probably gonna break all the vows. And probably probably pretty quickly too. And then finally there's the vow of um, of obedience, which many say is the most difficult. We all want to do our own thing, huh? It's hard to obey. All of you love to obey, don't you? <laughs> I will sometimes say to our parishioners in my talks and my formation program, something that, that really hits home. I ask them, do your children obey you? You know one of the reasons why? Because you don't obey the priests. If you obey the priest, then your children obey you. It's hard to obey because we're very headstrong. We have a very strong will. But I've learned as I get older and older, Unless I'm acting under obedience, my actions have no value whatsoever. Even if I were to raise someone from the dead. If that's not done under obedience, it's not worth a hill of beans. <laughs> you know, on one occasion, Jesus appeared to St. Faustina, we're going to come to that point. He said, I want you to spend a night in prayer and vigil. She goes to a superior says, well, I'm gonna, I want to spend the whole night in prayer and vigil. Her health was weak. And her superior said, under no condition. Now Jesus appeared to her, and she obeyed her superior. And Jesus said, thank you for obeying me through your superior. Jesus was pleased, the fact that she obeyed Christ through her superior. One last thing I'd like to say is um, about the religious habit. Let me say a proverb I learned in Argentina, in Spanish, and uh, I think you're going to like this. El hábito no hace el monje, pero lo defiende, lo define. 
How is your Spanish? It's a good one-liner. Some of you don't know, maybe you've forgotten your Spanish, huh? El lápido no hace el monje, pero lo defiende y lo define. Right, Elvira? Translation? You like that? It's a good one, huh? So the habit does not make the monk, but it defends him and defines him. So I'd like to tell you a personal anecdote that happened when I went to the hospital. I went, uh, when I went with my, my religious habit. And when I'm walking to the house, it was the, the emergency room, um, they're really good there because they have people that will actually take you to the place. Otherwise, it probably would take me an hour and a half to find the place. Because it's like a little city, you know? And um, what I do is, the person is taking, I try to be friendly, talk to them, how are you, what's your name? Are you a Catholic? I mean, why not? Yeah. No, no what, what happens, I always believe a, a non-Catholic is always a potential Catholic. Potentially, that person can be a Catholic. So I started to talk with her, I say, hey, you know, it's a pretty good day, and boy, nice and cool in this hospital outside, it's really hot, I really feel good here, you know. I said, hey, there was a lady that worked there to basically accompany people. I said, um, hey, are you, a, are you a Catholic? She said, uh, I, I don't, I, I go to Calvary Chapel. But she said this, I've been thinking about this, I want to come back to the Catholic Church. So I pulled out my card. <laughs> Okay, pulled out my card and said, hey, you know, if you want, you can come to Hawaiian Garden, St. Peter's Chanel, and you can come back to the Catholic Church. She said, I think I'm going to do it, Father. Wow. What would happen if I were walking, walking around in um, you know, flannel shorts with, with, a, with, a golf, with a golf cap on, with uh, Hollywood, uh, Hollywood sunglasses, you know, smoking a pipe, you know? <laughs> Can you imagine me that way, Elvira? <laughs> the, the lady would not have the, the foggiest idea of the fact. And when, I, when I'm walking there, people are looking at me. You know? And then I, when I go to, to the hospital room, this lady comes and says, well, you know, I'm thinking about getting married in the church. So those graces come about through the graces that flow through religious life, through the priesthood, but also the exterior sign. In theology, it's called an eschatological sign. What does that mean? By seeing that, that gets people, not just simply to look at the money they have, but rather there is something that goes above and beyond the grave, and that is called heaven. Amen? Amen. Was this helpful, this talk? Yes. Okay, I've got the 8.30 Mass, so God bless you, and we'll see you next Friday, okay? Thank you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in the Mass. God bless you, have a good day. Thank you, Father.